Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of July 8th, 2013. This week's case was sent to us from down under, from Perth, Australia, Dr. Ben Smedley, who, by the way, has the distinction of having the easiest name to pronounce that I've had in the past few weeks. Uh, so my thanks for that. But, um, you know, as you might imagine, my name has been mangled for years and years and years. My name's Amal Matu. Very simple. Uh, and uh, anyway, so I'm very sensitive to that. And I try to get people's names correct. So uh, once again, apologies if I've mispronounced any names out there. Hopefully, I can't imagine I'm mispronouncing this one, but... Um, don't underestimate my abilities uh, there. So anyway, Ben and his wife, Teresa, are finishing up their training in emergency medicine, and they are diligently studying for their fellowship exam. So first thing I need to say is best wishes to you, Ben, and your wife, Teresa, on your upcoming exam in August. Anyway, they were going through some EKG files and studying for EKG uh, portions of the exam, and they came across a really, really great case, virtually an entire Brady dysrhythmia course wrapped up into one patient. This is a 53-year-old male who presented to the emergency department with nausea, malaise, and sweats. Now, sweats is always bad. I learned if your patient sweats, it ought to make you sweat. Right? Anybody who's sweaty, really think about getting a 12-lead EKG, and that's what they did. They got a 12-lead, and here is the 12-lead EKG. And just glancing at this, uh, I think the first thing that I notice is that there's question marks. Why is the computer asking questions here? Obviously, the computer doesn't know what's going on here, so that's why we're going to interpret it. But there's a lot of stuff going on here. So. The, one of the things I want to ask you all to do is to hit your pause button and spend a few minutes, three, four, five minutes really studying this and trying to figure it out on your own. If you don't do that, you're cheating yourself. If you just sit there and you're the passive recipient of the interpretation, you're not going to learn as much. So go ahead and hit the pause button and uh, spend a few minutes trying to figure it out. Okay, hit pause. Okay, we're back. So now uh, for many of you who have actually cheated by not hitting the pause button shame on you i know most of you probably didn't bother so uh but for those that did you're going to get a lot more out of this case looking at this 12 lead the first thing hopefully that you notice is that there appear to be p waves that are very lonely they are not accompanied by qrs complexes all right kind of feel sorry for them they need a friend uh, they need a qrs complex to hang out with and whenever you see p waves that are not being conducted or don't appear to be conducted because there's no adjacent QRS complex, you've got to wonder whether you're dealing with an AV block. Specifically, is this second degree or third degree? More specifically, is this second degree AV block type 1, also known as Wenckebach, also known as Mobitz 1, <clears throat> or is the second degree AV block type 2, also known as Mobitz 2, or is this third degree AV block? Well, uh, you know, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to make use my calipers and map out. And uh, yeah, sure as heck looks like those P waves are mapping out. And the P waves map right through these funky beats. And that's the technical term, funky. Funky looking beats there. Your computer is actually calling this a PVC. And we'll, we'll do that on our own. We're not going to rely on the computer. All right. So first of all, the atrium is acting regularly at a rate of uh, about 90 something. And the P waves are upright in all of these leads and inverted here. So we're going to call this a sinus rhythm, first of all. That simply means that the sinus node is beating in a regular rhythm at a rate in the 90s. So first part of the interpretation there is that this is uh, a sinus rhythm. Now, there's some type of AV block going on. We've kind of established that. And whenever you want to know what's, what type of AV block you're dealing with, the answer lies in the PR interval. You need to look at all of your PR intervals. With Mobitz 1, as you recall, the PR will gradually increase, and then you get a non-connected P. With Mobitz 2, the PR stays constant, and then you get a non-connected P. And with, not Mobitz 3, but third degree hard block, the PRs are randomly changing. So let's take a look here. There's a PR right there. And uh, there's a really short PR, and there's a little bit longer PR, and that's a pretty normal PR, and then a really long PR. So it appears to me that the PRs are kind of randomly changing there. Uh, so that points, whoop, that points towards this being a complete heart block. 
all right? Also known as third degree heart block. So sinus rhythm with complete heart block. Now, if there's a complete heart block, what it means is that none of these QRS complexes are originating from the atrium. So the question is, where are they coming from? If those QRS complexes are not coming from the atrium, they've got to be coming from one of two other places. Either this is, these are junctional beats, junctional escape beats, or junctional rhythm, or it's coming from the ventricle. Now, usually the simple way of telling the difference between junctional beats and ventricular beats is that ventricular beats are always wide. Junctional beats can be narrow or wide. They usually are narrow, but if there's a bundle branch block, the junctional beats can be wide, and you notice that these are somewhat wide beats. So is this a ventricular complex or is this a junctional complex? Well, I like to look up in lead V1 uh, to try to figure out whether there's a bundle branch block going on or not. And it looks to me, there's, there's three beats up in lead V1. Okay, actually, let's enlarge that for you, okay? Um, so these are the two morphologies of the complexes you're seeing in lead V1. And, and this beat's part of uh, V1, so I'm just going to cross out that V4. V4 starts over here, all right? Um, now, how do you tell the difference? Is this a, uh, when you see large, wide, QRS complexes that are pointing north in V1, it could be a right bundle branch block morphology, or it could be a PVC. Well, PVCs uh, and right bundles differ uh, in terms of rabbit ears, and sometimes you'll hear the term rabbit ear. Uh, when you see a what looks like a rabbit ear, like that, um, you take a look at which part of the rabbit ear is taller. If there's a small left rabbit ear and then a larger right rabbit ear, that points towards that being a right bundle morphology. If there's variations of that. You might see a, a, um, a tiny Q wave or a tiny R wave right there. Sometimes you see a little hitch and then it goes up like that. That would qualify as more of a right bundle type of appearance also. And then with PVCs, typically you've got a taller, um, tall, whoop, let me get rid of that. You Typically you've got a taller left rabbit ear um, or you may simply have a little hitch, and essentially that uh, serves as the equivalent of the left rabbit ear, and that serves as the equivalent of the smaller right rabbit ear, all right? So if you take a look at this complexes, this has a little r and then a big r prime, taller right rabbit ear, so this is a right bundle branch block morphology, and with this, you've got Crest goes down and then it kind of hitches outwards a little bit right around there. And that means this is a PVC. So it's a very nice, simple way of distinguishing between a bundle branch block versus a PVC in that uh, lead V1. So we've got sinus rhythm, complete heart block. Um, we've got a junctional escape rhythm with a, with a right bundle branch block morphology. And there's also some PVCs in there, right? These are PVCs. And if that's a PVC, then that's a PVC. Those are PVCs as well, okay? Now, the other thing that, uh, that you may notice as well is that this patient has an inferior wall STEMI going on. There's ST elevation in three in AVF, not much in two, maybe a tiny bit in two, but there's an inferior STEMI. There's some reciprocal depression in the high lateral leads, maybe there's some reciprocal depression in the anteroceptal leads as well. Although it's normal to have a little ST depression in V1, V2, V3 with a right bundle. Uh, so that may not be a big deal, but this is clearly a re uh, abnormal to have the ST segment depression in those two leads. So this is an inferior wall MI. So let's just move forward and get to the final interpretation here. Um, so sinus rhythm with complete heart block. I think we uh, did that to death. Junctional escape rhythm with occasional PVCs. There's your junctional escape rhythm. There's a PVC and then a junctional beat, a PVC and a junctional beat. Um, there's a right bundle morphology, and that's your PVC right there, okay? And there's an acute inferior wall MI, and whenever there's an inferior wall MI, you've got to wonder whether there's also a right ventricular MI, and you can also wonder whether there's a poster MI because inferior wall MIs are often associated with right ventricle MIs, often associated with posterior MIs. We've talked about that before. I don't want to linger on that. I want to focus more on the rhythm. 
Um, by the way, I also put right ventricular hypertrophy in here. For those of you that are, um, well, for those of you that feel like you've learned enough with this case already, just cover your ears, okay? For those that want a little bit more, then listen up. When you have a right bundle branch block morphology, if the R wave is greater than 15 millimeters and there's also a rightward axis, you get to also diagnose right ventricular hypertrophy. hypertrophy all right? So, uh, okay, everyone uncover your ears and uh, pay attention again. So EKG number two, that's not enough. This patient's got a complete heart block, but then his rhythm changes and they get another 12 lead EKG. And now he's got something different. Once again, you see some, uh, let's, let's map this out. There's your P waves, all right? Don't be confused. Um, these are not just T waves. Those are actually P waves buried in the T waves. This is your atrial rhythm, okay? And so we've got P waves that do not appear to be conducted to anything. And whenever you've got P waves that are not being conducted, you've got an AV block, and that means you need to look in the PR interval to figure out what type of, what type of AV block this is. So let's take a look at all of our PR intervals. There is a PR, there is a PR, there is a PR, there, there, and so on. And you'll notice that all of these PR intervals now are constant in size. And that means that this is a Mobitz 2. So this patient has turned into a Mobitz 2, from complete heart block into a Mobitz 2. And again, there's still the right bundle and the PVC. Notice the taller left rabbit ear for the PVC there. And uh, the inferior MI is still there and, and so on. All right, just focusing on the rhythm. But that's not enough because then the patient's rhythm changes again to this and once again, you've got P waves that are lonely. And so when you've got those poor lonely P waves, you need to figure out what type of AV block you're dealing with. How can you figure out what type of AV block you're dealing with? The answer lies in the PR. So look at the PR intervals, okay? There's a PR, there's another one, and it's getting a little bit longer and a little bit longer, and then boom, dropped. And then it starts over again. It's getting a little bit longer and then boom, dropped. And it's getting a little bit longer and then it gets dropped again. So the PRs in this EKG are gradually lengthening and that means that this is a Mobitz 1. So really interesting, this patient started out with complete heart block and then went to a Mobitz 2 and then went to a Mobitz 1, all the while infarcting the inferior part of the heart and maybe the right ventricle, maybe the posterior part of the heart also. So what ended up happening with this patient? Well, the echo actually did show right side and posterior abnormalities in addition to the inferior abnormalities. Patient went for a cath and had a successful PCI of the right coronary artery and one of the obtuse marginal arteries ended up with a pacemaker, AICD, and Ben emailed back and actually said this patient is still attending their outpatient clinic, so appear to have survived everything and hopefully is doing relatively well, all right? So pretty cool case and a whole bunch of rhythms that we had a chance to look at. And the, the simple take-home point, the most important take-home point I want to leave you with is whenever you've got AV blocks, in other words, whenever you have P waves that are not being conducted and you're trying to figure out, is this a Mobus 1 or a Mobus 2 or a complete heart block? The answer lies in looking at the PR intervals. If the PR is increasing and then drop, Mobus 1. PR stays constant and then drop, Mobus 2. PRs are randomly changing, that's complete heart block. It really is that easy to diagnose Brady dysrhythmias. All you've got to do is focus on the PR intervals and ask yourself, what's happening in the PR interval? and you will come up with an answer just about every single time. So my thanks to Ben and Teresa for sending that case. Good luck on the exam, and I hope that was helpful. If anybody out there has any questions at all, if I went too fast over any, anything, well, it's probably because you didn't pause it, but uh, if, if, it was, um, if it was too fast anyway, just send me an email. Remember, my email is amalmatu at comcast.net. It's listed on the first slide. Send me an email. I'm happy to help out with anything that was unclear. And uh, until next week, take care.